everybody. Lots going on in the schools. I'm sure there's questions. We've written down a few. If uh, Dr. Wright doesn't cover those, uh, maybe we'll have time before she leaves to get a little well, bit Mark, of let's do it this way. Things, you know, let's play it like Coleman. He always has questions for me. So, um, you know, again, I have your questions, but however you want to do this. Well, you know, you know it's, uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, and it's probably in the big picture, although it consequences on down the road are coming when it, we start next year's school, but the buzz continues to be, I thought they were gonna start tearing down the buildings in June, then it was gonna be July. Now, you know, I heard you on Coleman, so I kind of know the answer to it, but last week, uh, I don't believe it was you, but I know somebody said, look, the equipment's coming today or definitely by next week and it's Wednesday and still nothing. So wanna to touch on that. Um, Virtual enrollment, I heard you say the other day that uh, the second semester is about 300 less. I found it interesting which age group that was. Six and t six to 12 returning full-time. Um, also, I heard Scott Benson yesterday talking about the continued discussion surrounding assessments, testing, accountability. Uh, that's gotta be a nightmare for you right now, I'm sure. But something else that we haven't talked about before that if, and I won't catch you off guard because we need to save it for the next time, that's fine. I can't speak for Wilson County, but Mount Juliet in the trailing four months, our trailing four months compared to the same four months last year, just the sales tax in Mount Juliet alone is up a little over $2.9 million. Now I know a small portion of that is from the sales tax increase that the voters voted in. And that was supposed to go for teacher pay. Yes. I don't know, my question would be, that is a is it a one-time bonus once you see how much money you got, then you divvy that out? Is it something that we're obligated to for future pay increases, irregardless of whether the uh, sales tax collections are running higher than budget? How does that work? And, well, and that's a really good question, Mark, because again, it, it, it's uh, just the way it was proposed. And again, this was something that came out of county commission uh, to look at what we could do to uh, bump um, uh, what was the existing sales tax up uh, um, a half cent. And the voters voted it in uh, because it was solely dedicated to teacher raises. Couldn't be used for anything else, which, um, again, speaks volumes as far as um, the citizenry of Wilson County. So with that, it, everything came out with whether it was a bonus or whatever, a bonus is a one-time piece, but what this provided, and it was a little over $5.2 million is what they projected uh, from that point forward. And then the pandemic hit and everything else. And so it was one of those, let's see what happens. However, the promise was made that teachers would receive a substantial pay raise. In fact, I call it a historic, a, a historical pay raise because the likes of which I know I've not seen uh, in my nearly 40 years as far as what uh, has been presented to teachers. Nevertheless, as we uh, presented to teachers as the uh, revenue would come in and not knowing what it would look like, particularly by the time we get to August, that we would give 70% of what we thought would be collected as far as on the front end. And then if, if uh, revenue came, if the revenues came in uh, as proposed, 30% retroactive would be uh, uh, fulfilled this December. So, you know, without going into all the details, our sales tax revenue has done very well, but not just in Wilson County. I mean, if you heard the governor's address the other day, um, it, again, it was one of those that, uh, I think they're surprised too, but you have to put everything in context as far as what's happened, um, whether it's construction, whether it's looking at people, I mean, uh, just the volume of groceries they were talking about, uh, you know, what had uh, uh, presented itself there. So with that, um, our teachers in August received 70% of what was proposed. And here's the, the, here's the unique thing about this raise was we, we need to remain competitive. And the thing that we had done, we had bumped our entry pay for teachers to around 41,000 coming into the district. So that, that made us competitive, but then the other districts around us, because we're all competing for the same 
uh, commodity, commodities, highly qualified teachers, they bumped up a little bit more. But the thing where we were really missing the mark were our veterans that had 20 plus years. Uh, they had, uh, they, you know, had flattened. Um, and particularly after about anywhere in most districts, 15 to 20 years, uh, unless you receive something from the state, they, you don't see a significant pay raise from that point forward. So what we did looking at those 20 plus vet, uh, year veterans, they received a $5,000 raise. Plus we have performance pay, that level of effectiveness. And uh, for teachers, for example, that uh, uh, are level three, that would get a $600 annual increase. A level four would get $900 and a level five, which is the top and where a lot of our teachers reside, um, uh, $1,100. So a 20 year veteran with a level five performance received $6,100. That's, that's substantial. And the majority of our teachers, we have a little over 1,300 certified teachers um, and administrators, they range from three to five with majority of our teachers in levels four and five. So the pay raise was significant. They just received a notice uh, last week uh, that uh, they will be receiving the uh, remaining 30% uh, on their December check. It's retroactive back to August. And so uh, that comes a little uh, nice, I guess, uh, Christmas surprise. Uh, when it arrives, but the thing was that we, we kept our word. Uh, the revenue came in as anticipated, if not surprisingly so. And this is something that this amount of money that's been generated by that uh, sales tax increase mark, that will sustain that amount that remains. It's not a bonus, it's not a one time. It bumped their level of salary up, just like our level of effectiveness does as well. It bumps their salary up. So our teachers, um, are in that competitive range. But the thing, the real value to this are our veterans that have 20 plus years um, be rewarded. And uh, that is something that I don't know that uh, in any district uh, you see that occur. So that ongoing salary increase that, um, that, does, that they're committed to get, that you're committed to giving them, that's gonna be funded by the sales tax. As yes. long as we, as long as sales tax collections don't dip back down below previous years that that extra expense is covered yeah and it's it, and this is something we had to explain to you because some uh, thought that that would be an additional every year because the sales tax no this is to sustain that 5.2 million uh, bump in our budget to support that pay increase for teachers so um that's that makes it sustainable um if it had been a bonus, it had been that one time, and then you know, it'd be different. You know, but it's I, not. I know it's uh, it's it's sometimes difficult to fund continuing um, expenditures with unpredictable revenue, and sales tax is very unpredictable in that if something were to go south, you're still obligated to long-term payroll expenses without a guaranteed revenue streams such as property tax. Exactly. And, and Mark, a lot of people don't realize this, and it's, it's something that's, uh, you know, school boards in Tennessee have no taxing authority. We cannot raise our own funds. And so when we get accused of you've raised our tax again, it's, it's not us because we do not have that authority or uh, by statute the ability to do so. But our dependency, any school district in this state is on sales tax. 50% of sales tax that's collected locally uh, funds education. And then we're also dependent as far as looking at property tax, that sales tax. And as you just said, it's a volatile measure. And I'll have to say there's been some uh, heartburn not knowing uh, where we would end up, you know, in the midst of a pandemic uh, and particularly with job loss and if people uh, would keep spending money. And uh, I'll have to say Wilson County's done a nice job, but you know, uh, but then, um, we have to also have to look at, you know, uh, how long will it last? Um, because there's always lagging indicators. And if, if this is just a, an artificial um, uh, bump in uh, spending because of people rebuilding, uh, repurchasing, and, you know, and much of it might be that one-time purchase, uh, you know, we have to be aware of that as well. And that's something that's always a constant reminder to me. Uh, don't, don't ever get comfortable because, uh, there's more to come. 
Well, that's chamber 101. Keep your foot on the gas. Shop local, shop local, shop local, sales tax. Um, Absolutely. A lot easier to keep the momentum going than to come to a dead stop and then someday try to start it again. So, uh, well, and Mark, the thing that's interesting, and, and uh, you know, there's several realtors on here, people are still buying homes and people are still coming here. So, that right there is encouraging. Um, but again, you, you don't ever want to take comfort that this is going to be something that we're going to watch continue because, again, we have to look and not only across the state, but you know, national indicators as well. And uh, I'm an old economics major, so I, I can't help but look at those indicators. And I refer to them as lagging indicators. They catch up. Well, you, you probably uh, learned supply and demand in about the first, sef first semester. And uh, a year ago, uh, there were about 13,000 closings um, or no available yeah. homes, single family homes in the national area. Uh, at the end of October, I think it was down to 7,600, which means an extremely limited supply probably less than 30 days average on the market. And uh, what used to be a $8 sheet of plywood is about $26. So uh, great time to sell. Not sure about buying, but uh, anyway. I'll remind people that if they look at the skyline in Nashville, which again, that's something that always uh, uh, has an influence on what happens here. I think my last count, uh, middle of last week, there were 14 cranes in the air in downtown Nashville. That's a good economic indicator as well record per square foot sales. Uh, this year, uh, gosh, homes nearly $20,000 average price greater than last year at this time. So yeah. anyway, thanks for taking so much time to uh, share that. That's something that's kind of near and dear to the people that are out there with their boots on the ground promoting shop local. And I know Watertown and the Lebanon Chamber. The, Absolutely. The nine banks uh, and community leaders that are supporting tea and community. Um, you got local government that's doing everything they can to keep business open for business and um, lots of balls in the air right now. But um, um, can you touch on a couple of other things, perhaps the uh, school and the virtual enrollment and maybe a little bit of uh, how you're navigating the waters of assessment and testing? Okay, uh, and uh, absolutely. And, and let me go back to West Wilson Middle and uh, Stoner Creek as well, because, um, you know, <laughs> I get a lot of hate mail on that. So, um, and I just want to remind people that we are, I don't want to say held hostage, but we literally have to uh, wait and see what the insurance company is going to do. And I could, I, I, we could almost look at it personally. However, when you look at the same occurrence in Joplin, Missouri, Dallas, Texas, um, where they lost multiple schools as well, uh, it's the same process, and when you're working with numbers that exceed many millions of dollars, uh, uh, we have to be patient, and it's unfortunate, uh, oh, how sweet, to be patient in that, and um, that what we do know, the insurance company and the engineers are in that final phase of it, but they, with no uncertain terms, um, informed us two weeks ago that we will not start the demolition and we will not put bulldozers out there. And so it's one of those that we don't want to do anything that's going to uh, hurt or, you know, put us at a disadvantage in what we are going to receive. And we are fortunate. I know it doesn't ease the pain, but we're fortunate. One of the few districts that carried insurance uh, to replace buildings. Uh, that's not the case. And I've been in other districts that you know what, we'll just take our chances. I mean, how often do you see a, a school catch on fire? You know, tornadoes are rare, so they would take the risk. I'm thankful because this would have been a real hit to the taxpayer had we not had insurance. So I beg for uh, uh, patience uh, on this because it's one, it's frustrating. Uh, we are in desperate need if you just look at the population. So with that said, uh, it's not something that we are not advocating and worried about every day, but they assure us that they are in the final stages. And so uh, with that, uh, the next thing- um, Dr. Wright, Dr. Wright, I think perspective is kind of important too. And while many of us see it every day, we're anxious to, you know, for, for new beginnings, I heard you the other morning say, um, right across the street, there are still residential homes that have tarps on the roof, many of them for the exact same reason, unable yet to satisfy um, insurance. So uh, um, I hope no, none of the hate mail is coming from uh, reasonably 
intelligent people because uh, I, I think it's more just what have you heard that the latest not casting blame? We, we well, know what the deal is. So one gentleman doesn't even live in Wilson County, but at least, uh, you know, it's one of those I call them the sidewalk engineers. Um, you know, they, they can fix it for us for about two million dollars. Yeah. So yeah, that, that but that's how it goes. Um, it, it's interesting right now what's happening. If you've picked up on, uh, I think the Tennessean and uh, Chalk Beats run a story that just came out this morning as far as what's happened to student enrollment uh, in many of uh, the surrounding districts, including Wilson County. And uh, the thing is that we're also mirroring, uh, mirroring uh, national trends. We're down about 3% on our enrollment. It's not a surprise. Um, Williamson, Rutherford, others are doing as well. But the concern there, because we are funded um, by a per pupil allocation, that it, it can be concerning. Uh, the question that comes up right now, we're right, right at about 18,400 kids. We were projected to be uh, closer to 20,000 uh, before the pandemic and all that has occurred. And what has happened, and again, I'm sort of, you know, uh, forecasting what, uh, as far as in the Middle Tennessee area, you parents made decisions that I'm going to homeschool while this is going on that keep my children at home and wait to see what happens. We had some parents that made the decision to go into private schools because some many of the surrounding private schools opened up and they opened up full time traditional and parents needed that so they could get back to work and we did not. Um, other parents have made decisions to do uh, online courses uh, or schools that are from out of state. And so, you know, that 3% dip is concerning. However, we're already starting to see some movement back into the schools, particularly from the homeschool parents that uh, they found that that's a little harder than they anticipated. And, uh, you know, I think the novelty runs out after a, a little bit and wanting to get the kids back in school. Nevertheless, though, the thing that we are doing right now, and I, I, I don't want to say I'm excited about it, but we're seeing some new opportunities and you have to look for those opportunities in the middle of disaster uh, is the virtual school that uh, we literally created uh, over, over the summer with existing resources, existing staff, and it was rocky uh, getting started. We initially had about 3,800 uh, students that were enrolled in the first semester. It dropped. Um, down a little bit and leveled because of um, parents and families inability to be able to um, connect to high uh, speed uh, internet or broadband. And so with that, we have found a sort uh, somewhat of a sweet place that not only are our teachers creative, innovative, but we have some rock stars that are providing instruction in a format that whether kindergarten through uh, high school uh, that has really resonated with some students uh, that did not thrive in a brick and mortar uh, environment that are thriving in a virtual environment. Um, some of it being that, you know, we have children that suffer from anxiety. We have children that uh, for whatever reason uh, just uh, don't, don't work well in a large comprehensive school they are thriving. And so we opened up our virtual enrollment with a hard deadline because it takes staffing and getting our courses together. Um, from October the 12th to October the 30th, we ended it. Uh, and we have right at 2,100 students that are enrolled for second semester. It's down from about 300 because we do have many parents that want their children back in school. Um, and you know, our K-5 right now is traditional. Uh, they're back every day because that was, it's really important with those younger children, but we can also contain a cohort where we don't have as much movement. And so if there is, uh, uh, as far as the virus, we can literally go back and look as far as within that room and contain it and, and quarantine accordingly. Grades six through 12, um, I know parents are not happy with this, but our numbers are so large in our grades six through 12 that we cannot maintain social distancing and there's movement between classes. I mean, and that's just the nature of middle and high school. I've had parents suggest, well, just put kids in a class so you can contain them and have teachers move. Well, that's not how it works. Our students are in different courses, start different levels. And so students move, teachers uh, do not. And, uh, but uh, we're getting better at what we're doing with our asynchronous and synchronous learning uh, 
models, we still have concerns that 30% of our families in Wilson County do not have access to good uh, internet uh, providers or uh, access to uh, uh, high speed internet, which is uh, critical for live stream uh, instruction. So that's something that as a community, we, we need to figure out and work because that shouldn't be happening in today's time. So a lot of that um, uh, is a lot of information, but the thing is that we're, we plan, we monitor every day. And I just released Mark um, and several of the news stations picked it up. We released a 20 day COVID report. My promise to the board and the community that we would start looking at 20 school day increments as far as where we are and what it will look like as far as moving forward and this, the first one, uh, the report came back um, as we monitored it every day and we documented 255 students and 79 employees in that 20-day 20 20 period that tested positive for COVID. And we had 1,100 students and 123 employees that were quarantined as a result of close contact. So you can imagine the disruption in any school and we've been fortunate so I might not see it as that, but if you're paying attention to what's happening in other districts, we have only had three schools to date that if we've had to put on remote for two weeks to get literally um, not only the building uh, re-sanitized, cleaned, but get let the virus work its course. Uh, we've not had to shut any of our high schools down. Thankful for that. We've seen that in surrounding districts uh, that's occurred because of how we are set up. But the thing is, um, what do we do for the next 20 days? We're gonna maintain our schedule. And that was part of the report that uh, um, as long as we're seeing that uh, the conditions are not conducive to moving to a full-time traditional instruction, um, we're going to maintain as far as K-5 traditional, because we can contain the cohort, but grade six through 12, we have to uh, continue to monitor because here's the thing, yeah, our kids are resilient. Our kids are not getting as sick as the adults. But if I don't have, and you've heard me say this before, Mark, if I don't have the teachers in front of the kids in the classroom, we can't have school. And we're protecting our teachers right now. And uh, you know whether they get sick because of a contact uh, with a family member or if they um, uh, contract the, uh, the virus outside, uh, we have to go through those protocols and a substitute teacher will never replace classroom teacher. So uh, that, that's first and foremost, protecting staff. Yesterday morning on the Coleman Walker show, Scott Benson, um, um, to fully validate exactly what you're talking about, he yeah. said one student um, took out eight teachers. One sick student put yeah. eight, eight teachers in quarantine or whatever. So he said, uh, um, you can work around all the log logistics, but staffing for uh, the, having the teachers is the biggest challenge um, that, that they're facing right now. So you know, uh, when you look at that close contact, six feet in more than 15 minutes, and if you see like, let's say a related arts teacher, they're going to meet different cohorts of teach uh, students all day long. Mm -hmm. And so it takes it takes that one. And then when you look at that rotation and, and it's it's one, it takes three to four hours to do close contact tracing in any school, three to four hours. Well, know? I was also seeing the extraordinarily high number of homeschool students that have dropped out. Don't know how you'll, anyway. Um, state testing? State testing. Well, um, something and you know, I, I don't wanna say that I'm, somewhat of a renegade, but I've, I've had a position of on state testing for a while. We're not opposed to assessments. Assessments are what uh, have made our district as strong in achievement and growth uh, and, and, and places in a very enviable position uh, statewide. So you use assessments for a purpose to determine where your learning gaps are uh, as far as where you need to reinforce, uh, where you need to accelerate. But state testing is punitive. It's a negative form as far as uh, the consequences. Um, it's set up to grade schools through an A through F. It's used uh, as far as part of a teacher evaluation. Uh, and teachers, uh, they accept whatever student comes into their classroom, they have no control uh, over those dynamics. And so um, the board, uh, our board approved 
a resolution that we proposed uh, and sent to the governor and our le local legislators. And there was about seven districts that sort of stepped up to do that um, two months ago uh, that continue with assessments, allow us to assess our students so we can sort of progress monitor where they came in and, uh, and what it looks like at the end of the year so we can individualize instruction, but take the accountability measures out. Do not grade schools, do not use it as a, a punitive measure uh, with teachers and, and in their evaluation. And it wasn't just for Wilson County. We, you, we created the resolution uh, and uh, special school district uh, used it as well. Uh, but we crafted it in such a way that this is something we need to look across the state. And uh, I'll have to say that there, at this time, there was very little uh, commentary from legislators other than to say they've already bought the tests. Okay, you bought the test, we'll use them as assessments for diagnostics, but take the negative, the punitive uh, accountability measures out. Uh, the governor last month though came out and said that he and the commissioner both um, supported it, but it would be something that would be a legislative um, decision. So the pressure is on. And my colleagues across the state right now are urging our legislators, you know, we're not opposed to assessments. It's a great diagnostic tool, but take and hold this year harmless, hold harmless this year and next year, because remember I keep talking about those lagging indicators. This pandemic's not gonna go away and we're gonna see, and when I say not go away, we're gonna see those indicators that are gonna go even to the next school year. Because here's, here's the thing that I wanna make sure that the community understands. We have people that are leaving the profession across the state. They're leaving. The pressure, the stress, the pandemic, there's a lot of multitude of reasons. The pipeline that feeds educators coming in is dwindling, it's diminishing. Fewer and fewer students are coming out of our teacher prep programs. And so if we see the exit on the other end and we see it drying up on that what would feed it, we're going to be in a world of hurt in this state as far as continuing public education if we don't figure out how we can not only bolster but support a profession that it, it again punitive measures do not gain us anything but if we use diagnostic measures on how we can approve it's not about money but diagnostic measures we're going to see a huge difference uh, as far as not only people coming into the profession but also being able to see some uh, important growth and achievement. So that's my that's my political statement for the day. Um, I feel very strongly about it and I'm not very quiet about it. As you shouldn't be, your teachers deserve it. But uh, you know, the uh, when the pandemic um, or the tornado hit and we thought we'd be removing the schools and building 14 months we had our fingers crossed, but it looked like it was gonna be possible to perhaps get them open by the beginning of school in August of 21. Um, it's beginning to look a lot like they won't even be open for the first semester of uh, 22. Um, a year, for, I mean, if it takes 14 months to build it, you're already two months into the second semester yeah. of next school year. Um, well, what we're looking at, Mark, we, we are pretty, hopeful that Stoner Creek will be completed by uh, December of 21. Uh, the footprint at Will West Wilson, which is much larger, it's, it'll be August of 22. And um, the thing is that we, we can sustain the numbers in both high schools, even if we can move back to a traditional, um, but it's gonna be all uh, dependent on where we are with this pandemic and with the virus. I mean, it, 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 it's a mysterious disease as far as, or virus, how it, uh, the symptoms are different for different people. And if this vaccine comes through as uh, we're seeing, uh, it'd be, we, would, we could treat it much like we do the flu. Gotcha. And so uh, we're hopeful that if that happens and we still have to use the two schools as far as to maintain our seventh and eighth graders, um, it'll be much easier um, it, it's, it, because, again, the buildings will contain that. But here's, here's the fear. People are still moving here and they're bringing kids with them. And they don't come in nice, clean bundles. So uh, after this, we see things sort of uh, 
calm down, uh, particularly with that, uh, maybe the introduction of a vaccine. Um, it concerns me what our numbers are going to look like. Um, and I mean, it, look at some, I mean, off 109, we're seeing um, some developments that have been approved, um, 450 to 700 uh, units. We're seeing um, uh, the same thing as far as south. People need to pay attention to what's happened between Glaville and uh, the Rutland area. Wow, uh, the communities are coming in. And then if you go north 231 of Lebanon Square, where did those people come from? You're over talking about over a thousand units. So uh, it's the place to be. Well, Ray Kroc used to say many, many years ago, when you're green, you're growing, and when you're ripe, you start to rot. So I say we keep the welcome mat out. Um, Absolutely. They're, they're coming. Absolutely. To school, so I can tell you well, this. Well, it's a good place to be, Mark. And uh, we've got a great school system, but a great school system only exists when you've got community support. And I, I tell you what, uh, I can't say enough, Mount Juliet, Lebanon, Watertown, uh, there's been great support. Well, we, uh, we're, we're, glad to, we're glad to have them. I don't have, uh, I've never in 20 some years at the chamber, never had anybody say, I wanna join the chamber. And oh, by the way, don't let anybody else move in here because I got all the customers I need. So uh, uh, <laughs> we're together and we're ahead of most, but- uh, Heaven forbid. Does anybody have any quick questions? I wanna make a, I want to give a little shout out. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to meet Rachel um, yet. She's on here with us with Great A Construction. Um, probably have no idea how much we brag on them and the impact, positive impact that them and their entire team had during the uh, um, tornado cleanup. Yeah. Uh, go from a you know a, a construction company that people would see their trucks here and there to suddenly be in the face of the, uh, the cleanup effort. And uh, I've got to hang out with Ken a little bit and keep tabs on the growth of your business and what, what y'all are doing. So kudos, hats off to all of you. You're one of uh, the many champions of our community. And if I haven't said so personally, I, I appreciate it and send my thanks to everybody. Um, thanks so much, I appreciate it. Yep. it uh, also today, be remiss if I didn't mention that it's, uh, you know, as we know, Veterans Day. Yes. Uh, and um, many things have changed. I think there's a parade in Lebanon. Uncle yes. Pete, uh, probably going to um, conclude at the Veterans Museum, much smaller scale. Um, and uh, if you have an opportunity to, to thank a veteran uh, today, uh, please don't forget that. And I think that is all I've got, unless anybody, I, I, we could talk to Dr. Wright for hours on end. I can tell, I love the passion and the enthusiasm. I think everybody loves, uh, you know, a boss that sticks up for him and goes to bat for him. And um, we know that we can play a small role in helping create and continue that, to grow that uh, revenue stream, to do the right thing, because when you win, we all win, that's for sure. So uh, I believe that's it. I don't see, oh, there's two, Marlon, what am I missing here? Mark, just let you know, we've got a virtual programs taking place at just about all of our schools today to, to honor our veterans. And uh, Bart Barker has been doing a really good job pushing uh, that information out so that you can't come into the school, but you can at least witness what not only our students are putting together, but just the recognition, it's pretty phenomenal and creative too, to be doing it virtually. Uh, he, he, he's doing a great job and uh, there's an, uh, if, if this gig doesn't work out, he could probably be like the Titans play by players. He's extremely uh, passionate and enthusiastic about it. And uh, he's just full of energy. So uh, that, that was a great uh, addition to your team. Absolutely. I don't believe at this time that I have anything else. I so appreciate everybody tuning in. When you get this link from Marla, um, share it with your friends. Uh, we know that not everybody's going to tune in right now, but there are people that view it later. Um, businesses can use this for a little self-promotion if, if it's beneficial, but uh, um, we have a ribbon cutting this afternoon, um, another one or two next week, and next week is our monthly luncheon. Um, you can still get a ticket. We cap it at 50 people in person meeting at the Courtyard Marriott. And our presentation that day will be, um, help me, I think her name is, is it Chris Tina? 
Kristen Jackson. Kristen Jackson. No, she is, she's the uh, information officer for the new amazing Christmas place that will be opening up. So uh, um, look out our window and see that giant clock tower. Um, well, two clock towers, one's giant and one's a clock, the, the other one, but beautiful statement right in the heart of downtown Mount Juliet. So we are excited about that. And then in December, our speaker will be the folks from uh, Recover Wilson, who again, um, like Rachel and her team and so many others, um, just came out of nowhere to make such a huge impact on the recovery of our um, county and, and they still continue the work that comes after that initial um, cleanup and everything. And they'll be doing this for probably years to come, but um, hope you'll take time to register for our luncheon next week. And with that, I believe, all right, looks like we're done. No hands up. Everybody go out and make a difference and have a blessed day. Thanks. Thank you.